Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with theCUBE. We're in our Palo Alto studio for a CUBE conversation. The uh, crazy conference schedule is just about ready to break over our heads, but we still have a little time to, uh, to do CUBE conversations before we hit the road. But one show we're doing this summer that we've never done before is uh, CubeCon, CloudNativeCon. I got to get all the words that used to be Cloud Native, now KubeCon's up front, but we're going to go to the European show, first time ever. It's May 2nd through 4th at the Bella Center in Copenhagen, Denmark. We're really excited to go because obviously a ton of activity around containers and KubeCon and Kubernetes, and we're excited to have a little preview of the show with two folks. We've got Wendy Cardi. She is the Senior Director, Cloud Native Applications Marketing for VMware. Welcome. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. And also uh, giving us a little preview on her keynote, maybe we can get something out of her, I don't know. Aparna uh, Sinha, she is a group product manager for Kubernetes um, and Google's Kubernetes engine at Google. Long title, just see the Kubernetes shirt, that's all we need to see. Welcome. Thank you, glad so, to be here. Absolutely, so for the folks that have not been to KubeCon before, let's go through some of the basics. How big is it? Who can they expect to be there? Uh, do you have the fancy letter for them to give to their boss to get out of work for a week? Just yeah. give, give us the basics. Yeah, this is going to be our biggest event in Europe yet. Uh, so we're expecting actually 4,000 plus people. Um, we expect that it'll be sold out, so folks uh, should uh, register early. And who, who, who should go? Actually, it tends to be a mix of uh, developers who want to contribute to the project, as well as users. Um, I think in Austin, which was our last uh, conference, there was a, about 50-50 mix of folks that were using Kubernetes. So it's a really great place to meet others uh, that, are, that are using the software. And as are well there a couple of new themes this year, or is it just kind of generic training and, and moving the platform along, or are there some big announcements that people Yeah, there, can expect? I expect some big announcements. Um, and I expect uh, you know, that there will be a couple of themes uh, around security, around serverless, that's a, that's a major area, and around developer experience, um, and of course machine learning. So those are some of the things that are top of mind for the community. And probably service mesh will be another round of hot topics this year as well. Which one? Service mesh. So what is that? Uh, it's a project uh, that is a part of CNCF uh, okay. around Envoy, and um, it's essentially the notion of having um, a stack of uh, services that provide everything from connectivity to um, API access for microservices. I, agree. I ask because we, we had an old customer of service mesh, I think they got bought by uh, some services company, so that's yeah, <laughs> this a little is confused. The, I think the term is an old term. Okay. Um, so obviously when you start using Kubernetes, uh, it's really around uh, breaking down your applications and having microservices. You get a mi proliferation of microservices. Um, service mesh essentially enables you to manage those. Uh, so set up security and uh, communication between those services and then manage them at scale. So that's really what a service mesh is. And right. Envoy is at the heart of that. And then there's a project called Istio. There will definitely be, uh, and there was a lot of uh, discussion around that at, uh, at KubeCon in Austin. And there'll be some training before the conference so this time. Uh, there are several co-located events. There'll be some training beforehand, so for folks that want to learn, uh, they're new to Kubernetes, uh, they're new to the concept of service mesh, I would recommend coming a day early or two days early, 30th and 1st, there's, there's a number of different workshops. It's, it's pretty amazing, uh, just the growth and the momentum of containers and serverless, and obviously, you know, Docker kind of came out of nowhere a couple, three, year, three, four years ago, and then Kubernetes really kind of seemed to jump on the scene in terms of at least me paying attention probably a couple, two, three years ago. And it's, it's phenomenal. And I even went just to check it out, Google's putting on all these little development workshops. This one was at Santa Clara Convention Center uh, probably a month ago that I went out. And the, the place was packed, packed. And it was, you know, get out your laptop, get out your notes, and let's start going through and developing applications and really learning. I mean, why, why does this momentum continue to grow um, so strongly? From uh, what we see, you know, we have enterprises that are in the journey of you know, digitally, kind of going on the digital transformation. Right. And uh, to drive that faster business model, they need technologies like Cloud Native to um, help them with uh, faster development, to help them with driving new innovations in their application. And, um, and I think that that's what we see in the Kubernetes community. I think we see developers and contributors coming to uh, conferences like KubeCon especially to really learn from each other and find out what are some of the latest innovations in this space and how they can bring that back into their companies to drive uh, faster development and at the end of it essentially driving uh, 
better services, better experience for their end users as well. And it's really been interesting watching the VMware story, particularly because you know people were a little confused when the merger happened with Dell and EMC, and how is that going to affect Pad and VMware? And yet, you know, the v ecosystem is super vibrant. We do VMworld every single year. It's one of yes. our biggest shows. Yes. The thing is packed with a really uh, excited ecosystem. Obviously, you guys made big moves with with Amazon last year, mm -hmm. um, you're making moves with Google and Google, Kubernetes, yes. and, and, and it was funny, people were concerned a couple years, it's almost this rebirth of, of what's going on at VMworld and this adoption of, of really public health technologies as well as open source technologies. Has the culture changed inside? Is this something that you guys figured you have to do, or was it always there under the covers and maybe we just weren't Paying enough attention. Yeah, I think it was always there. Um, I think you know we are very close to uh, the transformation and the journey that our customers are on, and um, obviously, um, you know, the customers themselves have a full stack solution deployed in their environment today. Um, many of them are using vSphere or vSAN or NSX, uh, vRealize portfolio to. Um, you know, build their business and they're looking at how to transform and add containers as another layer uh, on, top of our, on top of their software defined data center right. uh, to uh, essentially bring some of these newer technologies into their environment as well. So. Yeah, and Aparna, Google's been sharing open source stuff for a while, even yeah. back to early Hadoop. Hadoop days, it's, so you know, as, as big and powerful as a company that it is, and as much as scale is such an important piece of the competitive advantage, it's wild that you guys are opening things up and really embracing an open source developer kind of ethos to, to acknowledge as, as smart as you are, as big as you are, as much power as you have, you don't have all the smartest people inside the four walls at Google. Well, Google has always uh, contributed to open source. I think we have a very long and rich history of sharing uh, software um, and, and you know, really doing joint development. So Android is uh, open source, Chrome, Chromium right. is open source, uh, TensorFlow is open source, and Kubernetes really is, um, I think, uh, different in that sense in that there is a, there's a thriving community around it and Google's been very, very active and I've been very active personally um, in, you know, in developing that community and in, in engaging in the project. And I think that goes back to what you were saying um, about uh, you know, the meetups. There are several meetups all around, so it's not just in one location, I think globally. And I think the reason it's so, um, it's, um, um, so diverse and so many people are involved is because it does lead to you know, Kubernetes enables a benefit that is uh, meaningful uh, in, in, in enterprises, large and small, where you can start uh, rolling out applications multiple times a day, right. and it just gives developers that productivity. It's very accessible, and over the years, especially as the project has matured, it has become, you know, it's like my daughter or my son can go and they can use it. Right. It's really easy to use, so, so it's, uh, it's not hard to pick up either. And it's also interesting because we do a lot of shows, as you know, the Cube goes to a ton of shows, and everybody wants the attention of the developer um, if they haven't had it traditionally, right? Everybody's got a developer track, a developer this, a developer that. Everybody wants to get the developers, very competitive. As a developer, you have a lot of options of where you want to spend your time. But really, especially Google, kind of comes at it from, and always has development first, right? It's kind of developer first. So I'm curious, you talked about the community that's going to be gathered in Denmark when you've got contributors as well as users and yes. contributors all kind of blended together, not really forced together, right. but coming together around this, this universal gravity that is right. Kubernetes. What does that enable that you don't get if you're traditionally either a developer show or you know, kind of a user show? Yes, I think that's really important. And one of the beautiful things about open source is that you get what you see and you can actually change it and own it and it's not some other entity that, that owns it. So we'll have many companies um, presenting, so bookings.com, Spotify, New York Times, eBay, Lyft, yes, yeah. um, these are all companies that are that are using Kubernetes and also contributing to Kubernetes. And so it's a nice virtuous cycle. And what you get from that is you're in touch, you're in constant touch with your users. Right. So a lot of them actually use Google Kubernetes Engine and I know what they're looking for and so we can then shape the project and shape the product accordingly. And then the other just kind of question I always think is interesting when you're working in, um, in a, with open source projects and contributors, right? A lot of times it's a big part of whom they are, especially if they're a good contributor, um, you know, it, it's part of their identity, it's part of the way they connect with their community, but they have to get work done for the company too. So in terms of kind of managing in the development world with contributing 
people, you know, people contributing to open source projects as well as you got to get your work done that we're working on too. How do you manage that? How is, how is you know, kind of best practices for having a vibrant open source contributing staff that's also being very productive in getting their day job done? Yeah, um, I think engineers love to um, learn from other uh, engineers and developers and I think that community is um, the reason why they come and you know it's not only at conferences when everybody gets together at a conference like KubeCon but there's a tremendous amount of activity day to day um, offline over conference calls like Zoom and you know I'm on some of the calls that uh, Aparna is on and it's amazing you have people you know from all over the world developers from everywhere who will meet on a weekly basis and uh, they'll slack each other and and I think that um, that 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 sense of community that you know sharing of information and really learning some of the best practices and learning what others have done um, is why people come and and it's great to have a conference like KubeCon where people can finally come together and meet in person right and um, you know just kind of uh, just enjoy each other's presence and and communicate face to face and really connect uh, in person. So, um, you know, we're very excited about KubeCon and um, kind of being part of that that energy, that enthusiasm right. that, that is in the community. It's interesting, the, the Slack, the, the kind of cross enterprise Slack phenomenon, mm -hmm. which I hadn't been really exposed to until a couple of, of, of projects we got involved with, and I got invited into these other companies, Slack, which yeah. I like, wow, I didn't really know that that was a thing to open up that wall in between the two companies and enable a very similar type of interaction and engagement that I have with my peers inside the walls as I do with now my peers outside the walls. So that's a pretty interesting twist in enabling these tools to build community outside yeah. of your own company. Yes, it is, and Slack is a great uh, great tool for that. Um, but even aside from from the tooling, I think the, that um, you know the the pace of software innovation is very very fast these days. And if you stay within the walls of your company, you miss out on so much innovation right. that is available. And I, th I totally agree with uh, Wendy. You know, um, contributors and developers in general, they like to know what's next, and they like to contribute to what's next. And um, uh, you, you said you went to some of the meetups, so you can sort of see that uh, you're, you're actually benefiting from that, from both contributing as well as from meeting with and, and, and absorbing what others are doing. You're directly benefiting your company, you're directly benefiting in your own job because you're innovating. Right, okay, so before we let you go, any, any particular session or something that's happening at the show in Denmark that either you're super excited about or maybe is a little bit you know, kind of flying underneath the uh, underneath the radar that people should be aware of that maybe they, they didn't think to go to that type of session? Well, I think there are a variety of um, just, you know, excellent sessions um, at the KubeCon that's coming up. Um, you know, there are user topics. Um, our partner talked about some of the companies that will be there to share their experience. Um, I've seen talks about communities and contributors and um, how they can contribute. Uh, and build a community. Um, I think there are SIG updates that I think would be very informative. And uh, I also think that um, you know, there are a lot of announcements that will be made um, at the event as well. So um, I think that's, that's exciting for everybody to see the new innovations that's coming out that impact the community, the users, and uh, in general, the ecosystem as well. Pardon? Yeah, yeah, so if I were to lay it out, I mean, definitely folks should register early because it's going to sell out. Um, there were a thousand plus submissions and 125 talks have been accepted. There are 31 Google talks. Um, there's all manner of content. Um, I would suggest uh, users go a little bit early if they want to get the tr hands-on training in the workshops. And then as Wendy mentioned, the, uh, I think on May 2nd, there's a contributor summit, which is actually, that's the thing that's flying under the radar. There's, it's a free event, um, and if you want to learn how to contribute to Kubernetes, that's where a lot of the training will be. And the SIGs, the special interest groups in the community, each of them will be giving an introduction to what they do. So it's a really good event to meet maintainers, meet contributors, become one yourself. And then in terms of the agenda, um, I think I mentioned the topics. I'm giving a keynote, I think I'm giving the opening uh, keynote there. Uh, it'll be about developer experience, okay. um, because that's a big deal that, that we're working on in, in Kubernetes, and I think there's many new innovations uh, in improving the developer experience with Kubernetes. I'll also be giving an overall project update. 
And then some of the other keynotes, there's a keynote on Kubeflow, which is a machine learning framework on top of Kubernetes. Uh, and then uh, there's a series of talks on security and how to, how to run securely in containers. All right, well I think we're, uh, we're almost ready. We got to register, we got to study up and, and uh, make a couple contributions before we head over there, right? <laughs> All right. Absolutely. All right, Wendy Aparna, thanks for uh, taking a few minutes and look forward to seeing you across the pond in a month or so. It's May 2nd through 4th in Denmark at the Bella Center, Copenhagen, Denmark. Thanks again for stopping by. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I'm Jeff Frick. You're watching theCUBE from Palo Alto. We'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. <laughs>